Welcome to Birdwatcher. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the black capped chickadee. This bird can be identified by its distinctive black cap and bib, as well as its white underbelly with rusty brown flanks and short black beak. The chickadee can be found all across North America on the edges of forests as well as in urban environments. These are non-migratory birds, so you'll be able to see them all winter. Chickadees in urban environments can become quite friendly with humans. So friendly, they may even eat out of your hand. Since the chickadee does not hibernate or migrate during the winter, it needs to rely on other strategies to survive. To learn more about the black-capped chickadee, its diet, and other winter survival strategies, I decided to go and talk to a local expert. Hello, my name is Andrew Whiting, and uh, I'm currently an educational consultant, and I work in the fields of environmental and uh, cultural history. For over 30 years, I've been working in uh, different agencies. I've worked with Alberta Provincial Parks as a park ranger, Saskatchewan Provincial Parks as a park naturalist, and I've also worked in a conservation area doing uh, public and school tours regarding environmental education, and I've also worked in a variety of museum settings as well. Today we're going to be talking about the black-capped chickadee, quite a common bird, one of our year-round residents, and a very common backyard visitor to your bird feeder. Now, all animals are looking for food, water, shelter, and space. The question as to whether or not a bird can remain here is a question of food, and remain here for the winter. It's a question of food availability. So animals have broad classifications as to what they eat. There's your herbivore, plant eater, your uh, carnivore, the meat eater, and the omnivore who eats both plants and meat material. Now there's also other specialties within that, but those are three broad classifications. Now, if you think about it, herbivores, some of the plant material will be available year round, so they can stay active year round. However, an animal like a gopher or a Richardson's ground squirrel that eats plant material, but that plant material that it depends upon dies off for the winter and is not available because the ground is frozen. Richardson's ground squirrel can't migrate, so it hibernates, and that's its answer to surviving the winter. If you have an animal, say like a duck or a goose, that uh, gets its food and whatnot from a water source, like eating little plant materials, insects, larvae, things of that nature, well, they freeze over. So there's no food available to it in the wintertime because where it gets its food from, the water, that water is frozen. So that means the duck or goose have to migrate. And that's how they survive the winter. An animal like a chickadee, its food source is available to it here so it can remain as a resident and stay active. Now, this little bird here, the chickadee, amazingly enough, it can survive our harsh winter climate even though this bird only weighs anywhere from nine to 14 grams. Now, if you take five pennies and you put them on a scale, five pennies is 12 grams. Or, if you want to think of another way, a black cap chickadee weighs as much as one AAA battery. That one AAA battery weighs 11 grams. So that is the weight of a black cap chickadee and it is able to survive the entire winter period for what it eats and other strategies. Now, a bird like the black cap chickadee needs to eat 35% of its weight daily. If you were to imagine yourself as a 150 pound chickadee and you're solely eating yourself these lovely granola bars, you're gonna to need 52 pounds of food. So that means you're gonna be eating 686 granola bars daily in order to achieve what you need to eat for replacing 35% of your weight daily. All right. So how does the chickadee know where the food is? Chickadees have upwards of 15 different calls that they use to communicate to their flock. And of course, some of the calls that are most popular is the chickadee dee dee sound. And that is a scolding call. It tells where the predators are or warning the predators, but also the chickadee dee call is, hey, there's some food over here. Come on in, let's eat. 
Two other calls that are very popular to hear from the chickadee is the one that goes, Spring's here, Spring's here, or cheeseburger, cheeseburger. And those calls are given in the spring time during uh, nesting season, setting up territories uh, when they're uh, brooding and having their eggs. Those are the calls that they give in that point. It's communication between the mating pair. Okay, so there you go. So chick a dee dee dee. We're going to go over here in a moment and uh, take a look at what's happening with the feeders. Now, there's this thing in your brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is responsible for spatial memory. Where did I put my car keys? I don't know, because my hippocampus is quite small. However, for a chickadee, it's significantly large compared to other birds who don't need to remember where they put things. Now, birds in northern climates, what they'll do in the fall period is that they will actually start storing or caching insect material, seed material, into hundreds of spots throughout their territory. So they're capturing spiders, insects, different types of insects, seeds, and they're caching them in the bark all over the place. And they will be able to remember where they put these seeds. So if you have a situation where a food source might run out, but you've been busy caching in many places, you can go start searching your caches for the, with that food. If it's a stormy period and you're not able to get to a food source, you can at least get to a cache system and find that food. So again, 35% of that bird's weight has to be eaten each day in order for it to have enough energy and fat to survive throughout the day and night. During the breeding season, 80 to 90% of a chickadee's diet is invertebrates. During the winter, it's also 50% of the winter diet is insect egg band. So 80 to 90% of a chickadee's diet during the breeding season is insects, spiders, things like that. Then when those insects and spiders start to diminish during the late fall and whatnot, they switch over to a combination of seeds and insect diet, plus all the places where they stash their food. In the fall, insects were laying egg bands on the bark of the trees and shrubs and things of that nature. And the chickadees and other winter birds will go up and down all these stems and branches and they're looking for those insect egg bands. So they're eating insect egg bands, they're finding hidden insects, who are trying to survive the winter underneath the bark. They're looking for their food caches or seed caches and whatnot that they stored because we can remember with the hippocampus. So that is what that's all about. That's how a bird is able to survive and collect enough food to last the winter season. The chickadee has dense winter feather coat and when it fluffs up its feathers, it creates an airspace between its body and the feathers. That airspace heats up and keeps the bird warm. Chickadees will cluster and find well-insulated roosting cavities and practice what's called social thermoregulation, basically sharing each other's body heat. They also will perform what's called a regulated hypothermia or torpor to conserve energy overnight. Torpor is the ability for the black-capped chickadee and other animals as well to slow down its breathing, slow down its body functions, thus conserving energy and fat for the next day. Torpor situations can be short term such as hours or overnight and it allows the bird to survive cold temperatures and extended stormy periods. Helping out local bird populations. Well if you take a look around this yard fortunately when we acquired this property our previous owners did a lot of great plantings. They planted all these Coniferous bushes are great winter shelters. Unfortunately, we had a large tree here, but we had to cut it down to, to some issues, but it was a fantastic shelter. We've got Mount Nashberry over there, another pine tree here. So as you can tell, it's quite comfortable for birds to be active in this yard. Over here, I've planted a whole bunch of what's called sand cherries. So when I look for something to plant into my yard, I'm thinking again, food, water, shelter and space the four things that animals need for survival so if you can plant some plants that i give them not only food but some shelter that's fantastic so you can consider that uh, the one thing i like to invest into is getting a heated water bath for winter water for the birds because birds will eat snow for their water source but of course, when you eat the snow, it cools down your body core temperature and that drains away energy from the bird. So if the bird can get like liquid water rather than eating snow, 
it's better for the bird as well. So something that can be considered that way. Brush piles. Again, brush piles in the corners of your yard so they're out of your way, but they're there for the birds all through the year. Brush piles. And then the big things are windows and cats. Windows. As you notice, I have a front yard feeder and I have this backyard feeder, but they're far from the windows. So I'm trying to avoid any accidental window kills, like the reflection of the window. The bird thinks it's clear sailing and they smack the window. But I have the feeders far enough away that hopefully that's not going to be a problem and it hasn't been. But you can also invest into different decals and uh, ribbons or whatever that uh, the birds see in a different um, uh, sense of the light. Uh, iridescent and whatnot and uh, you may not notice it but the birds will notice it so there's lots of different decals you can get from different bird stores to put on your windows to help avoid those window kills. Cats. I have a cat but my cat's an indoor cat and when it does go outside it's on a leash and cats are um, by nature hunters is what they do so we can't fault the cat for doing what a cat does but uh, we as owners can either put bells on cats leash walk the cats just have indoor cats but cats who are out on their own doing their thing again this is the nature of the cat unfortunately cats do kill quite a few birds in our urban setting so uh, a little bit of control on the cat would be great and that can help out um, bird populations a lot in our neighborhoods and yards if you can't uh you know wait for trees and shrubs to grow in your yard grow sunflowers Sunflowers are quick and rapid, they're beautiful. They also help out the pollinators, such as the bees. We all know that the bees need help. So sunflowers are good for pollinator species and they're good for the birds later as well. Now the saying goes, uh, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. Second best time to plant a tree is today. So if you don't have a yard with lots of shrubbery in it, you can start those today. They'll take a while to grow, but in the meantime, you can grow quick plants such as sunflowers and those are gonna help out the birds and the bees as well. There's many organizations uh, that a person can participate in at uh, local levels, uh, even federal nationwide levels. There's one organization that's called the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Uh, and they do a lot to preserve our, our uh, habitats. And uh, if you don't have habitat, you don't have a home for any animal. So Nature Conservancy Canada preserves and conserves wetlands, uh, rangelands, forests, all sorts of things, aquatic systems. You know, if we can have those preserved and conserved, then of course you have a home. Home is habitat, and in that habitat, you're gonna find food, water, shelter, and space. And there's lots of volunteer opportunities with Nature Conservancy Canada to come and do habitat restoration projects and things of that nature. So that's one agency to look at. So in addition to Nature Conservancy Canada, there's also uh, an organization called Project Feeder Watch, which is a citizen science program. And for example, what I could be doing is I could be counting the number of birds that are visiting my feeders in different time periods and sending that data to a national base and they keep track of it and they see where different bird populations are going up and down throughout the nation. And that's valuable information to scientists and researchers. And in Saskatoon, there's a Saskatoon Nature Society. So of course, being part of the Saskatoon Nature Society, they can help you all things uh, can, <laughs> concerning nature and help you out with your birding or whatever it is that you want. The Saskatoon Nature Society, they'll gotta have it for you. Hopefully you learned a thing or two about how to help our feathered friends survive the winter. That's all we have for this episode. Thanks for tuning into Bird Watchers. I'll see you next time.